the people who lived at 97 Orchard in 1900 and 1910 were all um, Yiddish-speaking Jewish immigrants and their children. And many of them were very invested in what would happen in this country. They came to this country knowing they were going to stay in this country. Because they came to this country knowing they were going to stay in this country, they tended to become much more involved with politics earlier on. They lived in a neighborhood where there were some of the worst conditions in the world with regard to crowdedness, with regard to, to housing. Um, and so many of them felt very strongly that it was their job <laughs> as they became American to create a better America. And they did this often through reading this newspaper, and they did it also, the Forwards, the Jewish Daily Forward, they did it also um, by being part of political rallies. And when Meyer London was elected, there was a huge I want to say party, but I don't know if that's quite the word. Party seems too frivolous. There was a huge gathering at the Forward, and the Forward building is still there on East Broadway. It's now luxury condominiums. Um, but you can still see the busts of uh, Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx. And what they would do there is they would project on election night, uh, using a stereo opticon, the results of the different um, districts coming in. And as uh, and some reports said there were 40,000 people there, some reports said that there were 50,000 people there. As each district came in, and you could see that London won over Tammany's man, and Tammany's man was a guy named Henry Goldfogel, who pe no one was that crazy about, except Tammany, because he did what he said. Um, when London would win, cheers would break out and a thunder of, of cheers would break out among the crowds. And finally, I think it was 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. When, when, when London won definitively. Um, and at that point, the Marseillaise started playing. There were bands all over. And people started hugging each other and embracing each other, people, strangers, because of the sheer joy of, of this man's election. Um, and you can see in the coverage of the forward the next day, you know, they said things. And the forward was never, um, it, it was never simple. The language always was a little bit dramatic. Um, and, they and finally, the last tally came in showing that London was elected. And the Marseillaise was played, and there erupted a scene that could be compared to the scenes in Russia on Freedom Day. People embraced and kissed each other with tears of joy. And they yelled hurrah, and they cheered for socialism, for Meyer London, for the forward. And this is an image of him. And apparently, then he came out and stood on top of a car and gave a speech. And you can see him towering over the Lower East Side. And you'll see other images of him towering over the Lower East Side. Um, and uh, not all of New York and not all of America felt that way, <laughs> felt as strongly about London as the people who lived at 97 Orchard and the other tenements in this neighborhood. And in fact, in this very city, the New York Tribune reporter um, interviewed him, and, and they described him, which I thought, again, in contrast to this image here, he was bespectacled, he was undersized, is how they described him. Um, and what we're going to hear now is um, an actor, Jeffrey Marsh, is going to be reading what Meyer London told the Tribune um, in that interview. Meyer London knew that when he spoke to the Tribune, he knew that when he would go to Washington, D.C., that he would have an audience very different from the Lower East Side. And I think that's one of his, his uh, um, talents and his strengths was his ability to stay consistent with a message but know how to deliver that message to different people. So now we'll hear him. Uh, we'll hear Jeffrey Marsh reciting his words. Um, I'm sorry, this is 1914, November of 1914, exactly almost a century ago. I am going to wake up the American people to a realization of the social problem by presenting to Congress the condition of the laboring classes, the problems of child labor, work of women, unemployment, and the high cost of living. I will advocate in the present crisis in Europe the prohibition of the export of food and try to starve out the war. And I will advocate the acquisition by the people of industries which have reached a state of monopoly to be managed democratically for the benefit of the people. All of this is a big undertaking. All that the socialists can expect now is to awaken interest in these problems and to promote an understanding of them. I would consider my principal work to be to attract the attention of the American people to the existence of a social problem in America. Victor Berger paved the way two years ago. Then the socialists had one congressman, 
Now they have at least three. We will be teachers of the new philosophy and the rest of Congress will be our scholars. I expect antagonism in Washington, but I've been a student of political economy for many years and I've spent 20 years on the lecture platform and I know my subject. Okay, who is Meyer London? He's hardly mentioned in the history books and in the halls of socialist heroes, even though he was the first Russian Jewish immigrant in the House of Representatives and the first socialist from the East. He introduced legislation for social insurance, health insurance, unemployment, disability, and old age to Congress in 1916, and he cast a vote against the war. I think there were 49 others. Unlike many socialists, and it's sad to say, but many socialists were racist at that time, he was anti-racist, anti-sexist, and supported anti-lynching and women's suffrage. And he was an ardent fighter for unrestricted immigration and trade unions. During his three terms in Congress representing the Lower East Side, he was beloved by his constituents and the socialist unions. His death set forth a storm of mourning. He's remembered by his generation who named the Rand Library School after him, put a plaque on his modest building where he lived, and named a World War II naval ship after him, and public school too on Henry Street. So why is he erased from history? For example, the Rand School of Social Science on 15th Street containing the London Library closed in 1956. The library opened again and was renamed the Tamman Institute Library, collecting mainly union and radical groups papers. The rare back room was still called the London Room and the room had large paintings and photos of socialist heroes, one of them Meyer. However, there was a need for space, so the London room became the curator's room and the paintings and photos disappeared. Most of the unions that Meyer was affiliated with, like the Furriers and the Garment Workers Union, sided with the Communist Party when the radicals split from the Socialist Party in 1919. London was an evolutionary socialist. He stressed education, tolerance and electoral politics as a means to transform capitalism to socialism. He didn't think that mass strikes and violent revolutionary upheavals were effective political strategies as the communists believed. Mainly, he was beloved by the people of the Lower East Side who he lived with in a small apartment and never made much money. They saw him as a saint which in many ways he was. He was a lawyer for the unions and the poor. Not only didn't he charge, but he gave them money. This is an example of his self-sacrificing nat nature. Isadora Cohn, who was the manager of the Fur Workers Union, tells this story, and it's quoted in a book, and one of the profiles, there are profiles of 11 socialists, and one is Meyer London and Meyer London was a contemporary of the man who wrote this book. He says, it was the fourth week of the strike, and he says, we came to London with our usual tale of woe and told him about the desperate conditions of the strikers' families. On the table near him were lying an unpaid gas bill for about $18 and a passbook from the bank. London picked up the book, consulted the check stubs, then he remarked that his bank's balance amounted to $34, and he made out a check and gave it to us. During the agonizing weeks of the strike, London forsook his law practice, his home, his friends, and personal affairs, and gave himself to us wholly and utterly. He was there to inspire the men with his oratory. He was there to comfort and guide the strike leader. He was there to plead with the bankers for loans and other organizations for the help. He was there at the end to negotiate the peace terms with the employers. 
which laid the foundation of our strong union. Now, the union leaders understood that Meyer London would never send a bill for his council over two years and expenses. So they gave him a, a gift of $2,000 and a gold watch and a fur coat to his wife. The next day, Meyer London called the Furrier's Union Committee to his office. He lectured them for daring to send him money he never asked for. He was hurt and offended at reducing his services to a mere dollars and cents. They listened silently because they knew the depths of his sincerity. Later, the union heard that he'd given the gold watch to a needy worker. His wife was told never to mention the fur coat, and he apparently didn't notice her wearing it. <laughs> and there are many stories like this. In 1905 and 6, he closed his office for three to four months to accompany Russian Bund, Bund officials who needed an American to introduce them and he spoke every night. The Bund was a secular Russian socialist, not communist labor organization. Another reason he isn't well known is that he wrote few articles and no books. Like there are dozens of books about Hillquest and he wrote many articles. He also wasn't into party politics. He rarely went to the socialist meetings and he could hardly pay his bills. During the war, London was even rem reprimanded by the Socialist Party for not following their orders. Another reason he might not be remembered is that he was a very secular Jew. He never went to temple, worked on high holy days, and thought that the Arabs should be consulted in the creation of Israel. He therefore alienated many powerful Zionists like Brandeis. I think if he had lived to see the Depression and New Deal, he might have been better known because the New Deal and FDR would have embraced his ideals and his ideas. And I can say much more, but I want to keep it to time. But one thing I want to say is that I never would have had access to London's genealogical materials and other materials without the diggings of Keith Grober, who's right there. Keith and <laughs> Keith assembled Meyer's family tree, made a website, collected all the newspaper articles, and held several family reunions. Until that time, for a number of reasons, nine-tenths of Meyer London's family was unknown to me. Meyer and his brother Horace, my maternal grandfather, died before I was born. In the 30s, Horace's wife, my grandmother, was in the Communist Party, and she was a lawyer for many communist organizations. And my beloved father, who was actually quite saintly, like Meyer London, was in the Communist Party until 1957, and he had contempt and hostility toward the socialists, I'm sad to say. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the staff at the Tenement Museum for uh, putting on this, on this program. If you would have told me uh, some 40 years ago, when I first began my work on Meyer London, that here I would be almost 100 years to the day of his uh, election on November 3rd, five days from now, uh, I would have said to you, no way. Absolutely no way, but here we, but here we are. And I'm so pleased to see the, the, the turnout. Uh, I'm going to try and steer my way through this so I'm not uh, too repetitious because some of the things that I wanted to say have been already uh, mentioned. But let me say that London was elected for the first of three terms in uh, 1914. He served in the 64th, 65th, and 67th uh, congressman. As Roslyn mentioned, he was the first socialist from the East Coast and also the first Russian Jew. And let me just uh, go up here and for a moment. 
Uh, this is a, uh, the Lower East Side of, of New York, and London's uh, district uh, comprised where we are sitting, sitting uh, uh, today. I have another map that comprised the uh, second, fourth, sixth, and eighth assembly uh, districts, which was heavily Jewish, but not exclusively Jewish. I want to make that quite, quite clear. Here we see a photograph of a very uh, debonair Meyer London uh, walking across the Capitol uh, grounds uh, in, in Washington. And here we see one of my favorite uh, cartoons, uh, and that is this, this cartoon is from, the, uh, from a Yiddish satirical uh, magazine called the uh, uh, Groiser Kundis, uh, November 1914. And I'll read, I'll translate it for you. Uh, here's Uncle Sam, obviously, reaching from Washington across, I presume, the East River uh, to the tenements of the Lower East Side of New York. And he is saying, please, to meet you. And then below it says, a truly new type of Jew, I like you. <laughs> and Meyer London was truly a different kind of Jew. Uh, Roslin mentioned his uh, predecessor and his political nemesis, uh, Henry Goldfogel. Uh, Goldfogel was a five-term congressman preceding uh, London. He was uh, an Austrian Jew. Uh, his parents uh, emigrated from Austria to the United States. He was born in uh, this country, uh, attended uh, public schools, university, law school, and then eventually found a career in Tammany Hall. And the, the Irish who dominated Tammany Hall uh, were very clever. They realized that the complexion, the ethnic complexion of the Lower East Side was changing. And so what they did was they said, okay, we need some Jews to run for, uh, for office. Lund uh, Goldfogel first ran for, uh, served as a judge, and then he served in the United States uh, Congress. So here we have a one kind of a Jew. Uh, London referred to him during one of his campaigns as a zero without a circumference. Uh, <laughs> yes, L London, London could be very, very sharp. Uh, a match for anybody in, in, in debate, as his colleagues found out on the, on, the house, on the House floor. Matter of fact, when he was at the Educational Alliance, which is still here, uh, on the Lower East Side of uh, New York. Here's where he learned his history, and this is where he learned his English, and this is where he studied studiously. Matter of fact, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the uh, uh, Educational Alliance was established by the German Jewish community. Uh, they wanted to as assimilate these strange, bizarre Jews from Eastern Europe as quickly as, as possible. And you could, uh, they, there was a requirement at the Education Alliance, you could only speak English. You could only speak English, not your native tongue, your Russian, or for that matter, obviously Yiddish. So this is where London uh, really cut his eye teeth in debating. He was, a, uh, he, was an, he was really an intellectual. He mastered something like six languages. Uh, he was widely read in a, uh, a, divide, uh, a variety of, of, uh, of subjects. But I don't want to get off uh, too far on this. So he's elected to the 64th, 65th, and 67th uh, Congresses. And, in, and you have to understand one thing. He's elected in a very dynamic and critical period. You have to put him into historical context. You cannot understand him without that. Two things in particular. Uh, the war, the Great War, World War I, but you had to have World War II before you could have, obviously, World War I. So it was referred to as the, as the Great War. It was fought in Europe, on the North Atlantic, in Africa, also uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, and Asia, for that matter, as, as well. So it was truly, it was truly a, 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 world, a world war. 
Uh, London uh, had to deal with issues related to Wilson's, President Wilson's policies of neutrality, uh, re, uh, rearmament, preparedness. He had to deal with the questions related to um, intervention. And after that, also questions related to uh, war and peace, peace, mobilization of the American economy, so forth and so forth and so on. So there were, uh, so you have to understand this because this took up so much of his time and energy. And he was the spokesman for the Socialist Party, or was he? Because London always allowed his conscience to dictate his positions. And he, uh, and he refused to support the St. Louis Proclamation, which was an anti-war declaration of the Socialist Party of America in April of 1917. And he, uh, immediate, and, uh, he had to steer through a, a, a minefield of criticism from, uh, from uh, socialist critics. On the other hand, he refused to, he voted, he was the, uh, the one of 50 socialists, excuse me, one of 50 congressmen to vote against the declaration of war. There were six senators who voted against the war. He was the only uh, uh, member of the House of Representatives who voted against the declaration of war against Austria-Hungary. But once the United States entered the war, he either abstained on war measures or he voted in their favor. And why did he do this? Because Meyer London was truly an American. He believed that he could not betray the country or the, the, the soldiers, sailors, etc., of his, of, his of his beloved country. And so he attracted the ire of Right, uh, of leftists, uh, of uh, conservatives in the Congress, uh, and it was a no-win. It was really a no-win position for him. The second uh, thing that shaped his political career was progressivism. Uh, progressivism was a uh, the first major reform movement of the 20th uh, century. And progressives, they, this is the term that they use. Uh, uh, for themselves, progressives favored uh, both political, economic, and social legislation. It began at the, in communities scattered across the country, made its way to the states, and eventually to Washington. And President Wilson, uh, Woodrow Wilson, his administration marked the high water mark of the uh, progressive, the progressive uh, movement. Uh, it's been said by Arthur Link, one of Wilson's uh, principal scholars, that there was uh, that this paved the way for the New Deal. In other words, it was a big, uh, the most successful reform movement prior to the the, the New Deal of Franklin of Franklin Roosevelt. And in that capacity, Wilson supported uh, measures such as the uh, Keating Owen Child Labor Act. Uh, the Adamson Act, which provided an eight-hour day for uh, workers on the railroads, interstate commerce. Uh, it also, the kern mcgill Connecticut bill, which was uh, for uh, savage workmen compensation for federal uh, employees. But his most significant achievement, and the one which I want to just emphasize in, in closing, was the, his National Social Insurance Resolution which he introduced in the 64th, 65th, and 65th Congresses, which provided for old age benefits, unemployment compensation, a national health care system, and he, uh, the, House of Rep the, excuse me, the House Labor Committee, on which he served, held two days of hearings on this uh, bill. Samuel Gompers, uh, was, uh, who appeared to testify, Simon Gompers was the president of the American Federation of Labor, London and uh, Gompers were, were friends. Well, maybe that's the wrong term, but they were certainly acquaintance, uh, very familiar with each other, and had interacted any number of times. Uh, and uh, Gompers uh, testified against the resolution because it violated his principle of what is, is known as voluntarism. Gompers, Gompers didn't trust government. 
Gompers believed that unions alone could represent the interests of the workers. Not government, because well, as I like to put it, what government giveth, government can take it away. And Gompers was very much aware of that, particularly uh, with the Tenement Act, which was passed during the Roosevelt years, as when he was government uh, governor. Uh, so uh, again, but the, a, a London, uh, Gompers did not, was not opposed to an investigation and the creation of a commission. London, showing his flexibility, seized the opportunity, offered a compromise resolution. It was passed unanimously by the House, of Represent by the House Labor Committee and came up 29 votes short of passage in the House of Representatives. So he had support across the aisle from Republicans and Democrats alike. And the Congress at this time, by the way, was, was, uh, dom was controlled by the, by, by the Democrats. Uh, he would reintroduce the bill in, six, in the 65th Congress, and once again, he faced uh, a, debate, a de uh, defeat. He was very, very uh, upset about the entire uh, issue, uh, but he, can t he believed his role was to educate. And I would argue that when the Social Security Act was introduced by Robert F. Wagner, United States Senator from New York in 1935. It was based in part on London's proposal. And I did a, a study subsequent to my, uh, my dissertation on this topic in which I showed that there were approximately 40 members of the 64th and 65th Congresses who survived into 1935 and who voted on the Social Security Act. And interestingly enough, one, uh, two of those uh, members, one of them in particular was the chairman of the House Labor Committee in the 64th Congress. The other was the Speaker of the, ho uh, the House Majority Leader in the 65th Congress. Uh, David Lewis of Maryland s served as the floor manager for the Social Security. He was the, the uh, individual I referred to as the uh, chairman of the House Labor Committee, and another individual served as the Speaker of the House. Some of you may be familiar with the name Alvin Barkley. Some of you may be familiar with the name James F. Burns, Jimmy Burns. Uh, there are any number of names that I could throw out at you, but, this, but I would argue that London helped pave the way for what eventually eventually happened in 1935. Uh, I'd like to just read to you just one moment from the conclusion of my, of my, my book in which I make the, the following uh, comment. This might serve as a segue, a segue to, to Daniel. And that is that, uh, let me just get back here a bit. Here it is. Um, as Tony Michaels writes in I Fire in Their Hearts, the questions they pose, meaning the socialist, what is a just society, how might we achieve it, remain forceful and relevant for all Americans to this very uh, day. And this book was written in the uh, 1990s, all right? Oh, let me, let me just see one more thing. Let me see how I show uh, This is, by the way, just very quickly, uh, London was the House Labor Group. He was invited by, uh, even though Berger, excuse me, uh, Gompers, and he did not see eye to eye, we can see Meyer London, second from the right, mm -hmm. standing next to him, Samuel Gompers. In the center right here is none other than John L. Lewis, the very controversial president of the United Mine Workers of uh, uh, America, very young John L. Lewis. This was taken uh, during the coal strike of 1922. Here's another one that I want to show you, which attests to what I mentioned a moment ago about the controversy between uh, criticism of London because of 100% Americanism. Here you can see Judge Leon Sanders, who was London's congressional opponent in 1916, London to the right. Notice Sanders is carrying American flag, London is carrying a red flag, and it says, which flag will you uphold? 
in voting for Leon Sanders uh, as member of Congress uh, from S 12th Congressional District. Uh, I can't even read that. You love the American flag. Right. You love all the American flag. Right. Right. And this is the, in 1918 when he ran, it was again, uh, he was defeated in 100% Americanism. They fused against the Republicans and the Democrats. And here is a, uh, here is London in uh, 1920, a political uh, flyer. Again, showing his, that not only the candidate of the Socialist Party, but also of the favor of the uh, uh, Farmer Labor Party as, as well. And I won't show that when we go back. That's for later. Okay. Right. So I just want to. Um, stress some themes actually that have already been brought up by Gordon Goldberg and Roz Baxendahl. I want to put Meyer London a little bit in the context of New York City politics and especially uh, New York City Jewish politics in the second decade of the 20th century and uh, talk a little, little bit also about his, uh, his and his comrades' political legacy in New York and I don't really disagree, but it'll, it'll flesh it out a little bit. Um, before the 1930s, uh, Jews divided politically uh, three ways. There were uh, Democrats, there were Republicans, and there were Socialists. The two main poles of Jewish political activity and support in New York City were really the Democrats and the Socialists. There were Republicans, by the way. I mean, after, from 1911, for 20-something years, the leader of the Republican Party in Manhattan was a Hungarian Jewish immigrant named Samuel Koenig. And there were other Republicans, uh, there were other Jews who were um, attracted to the Republican Party, like, uh, we, well, a little bit later, but Jacob Javits and people like that. Uh, but the main polls, I think, were the Democratic Party, and particularly Tammany Hall and the Socialist Party. Uh, these were two very different styles of politics. Uh, Tammany Hall, which of course was the dominant political machine in Manhattan, uh, had a style of politics which stressed the local, the personal, the face-to-face, -face, and it valued sociability, masculinity, loyalty, generosity. Um, uh, well, I was going to say uh, honesty, but I think I'll say reliability. Uh, that means, you know, in, in other words, that if you uh, promise someone a kickback, you kick gave them the kickback, as promised. Politics for Tammany Hall was a business. It was about making a living. It was sometimes a shady business. Uh, but Jews were very involved in Tammany Hall. Uh, we heard about uh, Henry M. Goldfogel, and I'm glad that it, well, I guess it takes a, an evening in honor of Meyer London to mention Henry M. Goldfogel, but, but uh, he, he, he did serve in Congress from this district as well. And uh, he, he was, when, when, you know, there were Jews involved in New York City politics throughout the 19th century, but it was only at the end of the 19th century when there were Jewish districts, Jewish neighborhoods, enough of a concentrated Jewish population to make a Jewish electorate, that Tammany Hall started to say, well, uh, we need to put up Jewish candidates. And as was mentioned before, Henry Goldfogel, former judge, uh, was one of those candidates. And he was elected, and he did serve. Um, he, he served uh, from 1900 to 1914. He was defeated by London. He, he later defeated London, and London de defeated them again. Um, But when Jews, uh, so when Jews got involved in Tammany Hall, however, they had to acculturate to some degree to the dominant culture within Tammany, which was Irish and Catholic. Um, one observer in 1906 uh, put it this way. He said, the Russian Jewish young man, generally a lawyer, who casts his fortunes with Tammany Hall gradually assumes the habits of his Tammany confreres. He chews, smokes, drinks, gambles, visits the club rooms religiously, attends the politico-social functions of the year, is prominent in the purchase of chowder tickets, 
and is rewarded perhaps by being permitted to play at the Tammany Chowder game of poker with the elite of the district. As a rule, these, Russian, these young Russian Jewish men who make their way into Tammany Hall belong to the lower order. In some cases, the office holders are taken from the most colorless class, having nothing but regularity and party fealty as their redeeming features. And in fact, there was a kind of um, uh, what I call an emerald ceiling in Tammany Hall. Uh, it, it was only so far that a non-Irishman could rise. It was easier, in fact, to rise to Congress than to rise to a district leadership uh, because the district leadership in the district at home was where the action was, where the business was. Being in a way at Congress in Washington, that kind of took you out of the action. So they could put a congressman, Henry Goldfogel, and you know, send him to Washington. But, it, but the district leaders, for the most part, with a couple of exceptions, remained um, Irish. The socialists, of course, were a completely different style of politics. Their style was ideological, it was abstract, it was transnational. Uh, it had a vision of social transformation, social justice. For them, at, well, we heard about London, certainly politics was not a way to make a living. It was uh, a way to have an effect on the world, to, to structure the world and society in a, in a different way. The same observer who talked about the Tammany Jewish politician talked about the socialists. He said they were the most remarkable of all. As a rule, the socialist leaders are students whose collegiate course has been prematurely cut off by reasons of migrations caused by anti-Semitism or economic distress. Here they return to their studies and become powerful debaters or excellent journalists and some of them also became labor lawyers, uh, like London. Of course, just as uh, there, there were others besides the Irish and Tammany, there were others besides the Jews in the socialist movement. It was not a completely uh, socialist, uh, I mean, a completely Jewish party by any means. But in New York, uh, the Jews set the tone for socialism and the socialist movement culturally. Uh, and I can tell you, I remember as late as the 1970s uh, talking to old uh, non-Jewish socialists who, you know, had Yiddish words coming out. Every other word was a Yiddish word because they hung out so much uh, with Jews in New York City. Huh? I will tell them, don't worry. <laughs> um, so uh, they set the tone uh, for socialism. As a matter of fact, n uh, uh, the Socialist Party had a kind of brief electoral heyday in New York. Meyer London was elected in 1914 to Congress, but over the next eight years, uh, there were Socialist Congress, there was, well, just Meyer London to Congress, there were Socialist Assemblymen, there were Socialist uh, City Aldermen, uh, and there was one Socialist Municipal Judge. Uh, not all of these office holders were Jewish, but they were all from predominantly Jewish. Jewish immigrant working class districts in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. Um, the Socialist Party fell on ele hard electoral times in the 1920, in the 1920s. Uh, partly this was because of gerrymandering. You know, if Brownsville or the Lower East Side sent Socialists to the Assembly or to Congress, you simply put Brownsville and the Lower East Side in two or three different districts. Uh, as was mentioned, the Democrats and Republicans fused against the socialists. Uh, the socialist uh, factional disputes with the communists sapped, I don't think the communists sapped a lot of votes, but they sapped a lot of energy uh, away from the socialist movement. And so the socialists were sent into kind of a political wilderness. Um, but they were very uh, practical people, we heard. I mean, Meyer London was not uh, far out of the political mainstream. The socialists, especially in the Jewish uh, community, I mean, they ran the Forward, which was a major newspaper and a big business in New York. They had the Workmen's Circle with tens of thousands of members, the unions. Um, they were actually very much engaged in, not just in theoretical politics, but in real, um, everyday bread and butter politics, and yet they were shut out electorally. They were trying to find a way back in, and in the 1930s, as has been mentioned, uh, they did find a way back in. Uh, they supported Rose. They came to support Roosevelt. Uh, they also came to support uh, the biggest New Dealer in New York City. And who was that? 
That was Frank, that was uh, Fiorella LaGuardia, right? And he was not even a Democrat. Uh, so they found a way to um, have their kind of independent labor political cake and eat it too, which is that in 1936, they founded a party called the American Labor Party. They took advantage of a quirk in New York State electoral law, which still exists today, uh, that candidates can be the candidate of more than one party at a time. So they had their independent party. It was basically a social democratic party. It had ties with socialist and social democratic parties in Europe, but it backed progressive candidates of both major parties and ran its own parties, uh, candidates when it seemed appropriate. Um, the American Labor Party and later another splinter group, the, the Liberal Party, helped give New York, uh, the New York New Deal, a particularly social democratic tinge. Uh, and it helped to give New York, uh, New York City, this peculiar social democracy in one city, uh, which lasted another half century or so, a little less, uh, into at least the 1970s, where New York uh, had probably the most advanced uh, welfare state in the country. Uh, one of these um, socialist elected officials from the World War I era was August Klessens. He was uh, actually of Swiss Catholic uh, background. Uh, he was elected from Harlem to the assembly several times. Uh, and he said, the only, he said the only ones in the district who are not Jewish are the janitors, the assemblymen, meaning himself, and the cats. And he's not too sure about the cats. Uh, but he also, um, you know, he, he learned this, uh, he knew a little German, he learned this word kugel. And he started, he said, I'm not, I like that, I'm going to start using it in speeches. He said, uh, you know, start using the word kugel in speeches. And then people came up to the, him and they, and they said, Comrade Klessens, uh, you're, you're saying the word wrong, it's kegel. And he said, okay, so I'll say kegel. So he said, so he started saying kegel. And then people came up to him and said, Comrade, you're saying this word wrong, it's kugel. So he was very confused, so he asked his wife, who was Jewish, whom he met at the Rand School, by the way. Both his wives, he, his first wife died in his, <laughs> well, in succession. Uh, he met at the Rand School, and they were both Jews. Um, he said, you know, what is this, is it kugel or kegel? And she said, really, it's the same thing. It's both the same kind of pudding. It could be a noodle pudding or a potato pudding, but it just depends where you're from, and you pronounce it differently. So he said, okay. So in speeches, he started to say that the difference between the Democrats and Republicans was the difference between kugel and kegel. <laughs> and it went over big. Twenty years later, he was making speeches for the American Labor Party, and they were supporting Roosevelt. And some old timer who you know remembered him came up to him, and they said, "Klessens, do you still think the difference between the Democrats and Republicans, the difference between Kogel and Kegel?" And he said, "Yes, but the New Deal is at Simis." <laughs> and Meyer London helped to build that Simis. And Simmis is a sweet carrot raisin dish as well. Um, what we're going to do now is, um, well, in, in June uh, of 1926, Meyer London was killed in an automobile accident. Um, so he died at the age of 54, 50, 56. He died at the age of 56, sadly. Um, what then happened, if you remember at the beginning when I got up, I talked about how when he was elected, there were maybe 50,000 people in front of the forward celebrating his election. Um, when he died, there were 500,000 people marking his procession, his funeral procession. The New York Times on June 10th, I think two, a few days after he, he died, wrote about this procession, and um, Jeffrey Marsh is just going to read that for us. So you get the sense of the impact he had at the time on, on New Yorkers. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And I think this is right in front of the Educational Alliance that was mentioned earlier, and that you can see Seward Park Library. That's Forward Hall. That's Forward Hall. The funeral was in. The funeral was right. under Forward Hall. And, but I think that building right there is the Educational Alliance. East side in tears as London is buried. <laughs> 
The East Side witnessed a striking pageant of sorrow yesterday when 50,000 men and women of varying ages, nationalities, religions, and social positions followed the body of ex-Congressman Meyer London through the neighborhood he had served in public life, while a crowd estimated at 500,000 lined the streets. In windows and fire escapes, doorways and stairways, the watchers stood, while sidewalks were jammed six deep in some places. As the Pitt Street Synagogue was passed, a rabbi stood amid the mourners, chanting the funeral dirge, and further along the street was piled a collection of bedding, bureaus, tables, and chairs, the property of a dispossessed family, persons who recalled Mr. London's fight several years ago for better working conditions, remarked that there had been many more families in that predicament before Mr. London brought about his labor reforms. Attempts to maintain an orderly marching file four abreast proved fruitless. Hundreds of the watchers joining the marchers at intervals. When the cortege reached 2nd Avenue on the way to the London home in 18th Street, the ranks were 12 abreast. Thousands of others followed on the sidewalks along the entire route of the march. It seemed as if every organized labor body in the city was represented in the line. Bakers, actors, necktie makers, and every type of needle worker carried signs of their unions. And members of the Workmen's Circle, the Socialist Party, and other bodies with which Mr. London was associated marched in groups. Services were held first at the Jewish Daily Forward Building, 174 East Broadway. Here, a thousand of Mr. London's friends and associates gathered to hear him eulogized, while about 50,000 stood in Seward Park across the street, the addresses being carried to them through amplifiers. Men and women wept as the life of Mr. London was reviewed. Congressman Victor L. Berger of Milwaukee, the only socialist now in Congress, recalled the hardships of Mr. London's early years and his work in Congress when he was surrounded by a sea of hatred. Mr. London was one of the foremost champions of the proletariat in New York, he said. It is hard to be a pioneer, whether in the field of science or religion or politics, and Mr. London was truly a pioneer. Like every socialist in public life, he was the subject of ridicule and the butt of jokes in the capitalist press. But his lovable disposition brought him the admiration and respect of the men who served with him and he is remembered favorably today in Washington. That Mr. London's first words after his accident were a plea that the driver of the car that struck him be released speaks volumes of his character. He is love. He, his love of the downtrodden men and women all over the world indicates the type of his ideals. It is the people who also have high ideals such as his who will keep his memory sacred now that he has gone. Okay, I'd like to invite our speakers forward to uh, take a place on the stools so I could facilitate just a little uh, question and answer, allow the audience to uh, participate a little bit and ask some questions for three, four really wonderful presentations, uh, just fantastic, both the historical perspective and then the dramatic readings, so wonderful. One wonders listening to the story of the funeral procession. I don't know, uh, Mark Fetterman, who's third generation Russian daughters here on the Lower East Side, whether or not um, fish slicers were among those in the funeral line. Going over the Delancey Street Bridge, by the way, right here, uh, and eventually into Queens in the Mount Carmel Cemetery uh, where just uh, two falls ago Annie Polland led us through a great walk. Uh, you can actually go to Mayor London's grave. He's, he's essentially buried right next to Abe Kahn uh, from the forward and many other giants of this era that we're talking about. Sholem Aleichem obviously um, also right there so uh, a highly recommended. Um, I learned something new tonight which is that the Tamament Archive was called the London Room. Um, There's the whole archive. The, right. And, and there was in the Poconos a great place called the Tamament Playhouse. Right. 
which since we're still in the year of the yard site, where Sid Caesar actually first cut his teeth. So I just feel like this connection. And one thinks of Sid Caesar doing all of those gibberish accents and something about his own childhood in Yonkers. And if you've read about him, he talks about the association with everyone who came to America and began their life anew and that sense of camaraderie, that sense of brotherhood that all of our historians, I think, really brought to the forefront about the about the sense of the the ethic of Mayor London. I think first, just to ask of our uh, any of our panelists who care, I was thinking about this question throughout all of your presentations, and then uh, Daniel uh, said, and I think I'm quoting directly uh, about Mayor London's life. It was not a way to make a living; it was a way to have an effect on the world. Um, and so I ask you as three people who have really brought this incredible man to life for us in a, just a wonderful discussion, if your own motivations about being historians and storytellers about the past was in part not just to tell the story, but so that the story itself of the past could actually have a positive effect on changing the world. Well, I mean, I'm a historian, but I've also been an activist in the civil rights movement and the women's liberation movement. And partially that comes from my family who were activists in their own way, different kind of activists. But I mean, I can't tell you how many demonstrations and things I was in the beginning of the women's liberation movement. So I feel that this relative is very akin to me. Mm -hmm. uh as a uh, faculty member in the State University of, uh, System of Pennsylvania, uh, we are unionized. And we are one of the uh, few organizations in the country uh, public employees have the right to, have the right to strike. So uh, I'm also uh, an activist in a, in, a, in, a different, in a different sense. I always think of myself as a New Deal liberal, um, a throwback uh, to, uh, to that. But I could very readily identify with, with, uh, with Meyer London. Uh, and uh, uh, it was always the cause. Uh, he fought for the downtrodden. Uh, he uh, was simply a, I, I like to, in, in my book, and I reached this conclusion about him, he was, he was uh, to use a Yiddish expression, a mensch. He was just a decent human being. And anybody who had any association with him recognized him for exactly what it was. Some people couldn't understand some of his colleagues. Mar Mars Hilkowitz, for example, was a contemporary. Uh, his name was Mars Hilkowitz. Uh, Mars Hilkowitz was uh, about, uh, let's see, London was born, uh, Hilkowitz was 10 years London senior. And he uh, chose to anglicize his name. Uh, he was a very successful uh, attorney. London was very, very choosy on the kind of cases he would he would take. He would never think of owning, a, of, uh, of representing a, a workshop uh, owner, a factory owner. Uh, he always took the kind of cases that he could readily uh, identify with, and people understood that. So uh, again, he was a, and the cause was always everything to him and his and his wife, mm -hmm. always the cause. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I guess, well, I, I, I do think that history is very important, and I think it's important because it uh, enables people to make better decisions about uh, current issues as well. And I, 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 I guess that I don't always think the lessons are necessarily that straightforward or crystal clear, but I think, nevertheless, history is an important thing uh, in terms of um, uh, social and civic engagement. Uh, I am also interested in these kinds of people like Meyer London, like Mars Hilqua too, uh, because I think they have been lost in, in history a little bit. They don't have this kind of memory constituency which uh, kept them alive as some other, uh, even people on the left have been kept alive in memory. And uh, they were very practical and they, and they did do, I think, a, very, a lot of very effective work in making uh, society just a little bit more uh, egalitarian, a little bit more democratic. Uh, they didn't uh, make, bring a transition to socialism, uh, but they made people's lives better, and I think that they should be remembered for that. <laughs>
Um, your, uh, Daniel, your Kugel Kegel story, uh, I was kibitzing with uh, Annie, brought to mind the, I think it was the 2000 election when people were comparing George Bush and Al Gore to, I think it was Banana Republic versus J. Crew, I think was the, uh, was the line. Um, neither of them Jews, as far as we know, though I think it's Al Gore's daughter is married to a Schiff, I believe, if I'm correct about that. Uh, did they? Well, they once were divorced. Who had two wives? Who was it? Uh, Goldschlager had two wives? Who had? Classens. <laughs> Classens, okay. Anyways, I don't know. In any case, uh, here's the question I want to ask. If you look at, if you look at, and, and the Banana Republic J. Crew joke, kind of instructive of, you know, what do, what is the distinction between the parties, and it's interesting how it echoes back to Mayor London's era. Um, you know, if we look over Congress today, uh, there's one socialist uh, Jew in Congress. That's Bernie Sanders from Vermont. And I've written here um, about Meyer London, and he's very aware of Meyer London. Right, and then you've got obviously in New York we have Senator Charles Schumer, a Democrat. Uh, famously in Congress, I guess also we could say we've got Al Franken in Minnesota. <laughs> Um, recently, uh, apropos of the close race in Wisconsin, I'm going to campaign, just full disclosure, for Mary Burke, who's trying to unseat Scott Walker. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'll be spending my Shabbos going door to door in Milwaukee. But uh, actually, the, the voter ID law was uh, turned over by uh, li uh, uh, a federal judge, Lynn Edelman, uh, from a very strong Democratic uh, Jewish tradition in Milwaukee. When you look out as historians over the political landscape today, is the Jewish voice as relevant uh, today as it was 100 years ago in, in American politics? My only observation is when I was doing some activity with Occupy, and I noticed there were a lot of Protestant clergymen and even some Catholic, and there were no Jews. And that was very different than in the civil rights movement, where I saw all three religions, and what stood out to me were the Jewish people. And that wasn't true recently with Occupy. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that there, there has been a fairly distinctive Jewish uh, political voice uh, for much of the last century, but I do think it's becoming more... It is bec as Jews become more like other uh, middle class, mostly middle class urban and suburban Americans, uh, that voice is becoming less distinctive. Uh, but it's, uh, I think, amazing how long echoes of this immigrant working class politics have lasted. Uh, in the in the last two elections, uh, Jews, according to polls, gave over seventy percent of their votes to Obama, and this is unlike uh, other whites in. Uh, Jews are a predominantly white group in the United States who have not voted Democratic since 1964 in national elections. So there is this persistent kind of Jewish liberalism. I think the contents of it has changed over time uh, with the issues that are, the general issues that come up. And, uh, I, I, and also, by the way, there was a Jewish presence in Occupy. There were Jewish celebra celebrations of Jewish holidays. Uh, I have a colleague at Fordham, Ayala Fader, in the anthropology department. Uh, who has been studying this, was studying this phenomenon and, and writing about it. Uh, but I think, especially in New York, perhaps, uh, this kind of left-leaning Jewish political uh, attitude is going to be changing soon because the dem demography of the Jewish community is changing. Uh, the, the older uh, more secular or kind of liberal, liberal religious Jewish community is aging, is assimilating, intermarrying. Uh, their children and grandchildren are not Jewish. They're moving out. Uh, and the community that is taking its place is the Orthodox community. The Jewish population of the five boroughs of New York City grew in the last 10 years for the first time in half a century entirely uh, on the basis of the birth rate of the ultra-Orthodox community. And they are more conservative in pretty much every way. And uh, they will be voting differently, and they will be giving a different kind of Jewish style. The, this, liberal, this Jewish liberalism and radicalism was, after all, it's not really based, uh, I don't know if you will agree with this, but I don't think it's based in Jewish texts. I don't think it's based in the prophets or 
the Torah or the Talmud or anything else. I think it was based in a very particular historical experience. And, um, and the new community which is rising up is, is a different reaction to that experience. We have a time for a couple of questions from uh, the audience. Yes? Uh, yes. Say, say it again. Sorry. Uh huh. So if you, if, you, if you don't mind using the microphone for your question, that'd be quite helpful. Thanks. I'm interested to know if, in the first, say, 20, 25 years of the 20th century, what the relationships were between the socialists and the Anarchists. Well, uh, if you're asking about Meyer London in particular, Meyer London had no use for the socialists, uh, for, excuse me, for the anarchists. A uh, matter of fact, uh, his father, who was a uh, philosophical anarchist, uh, who, uh, who held court uh, in his printing shop on the Lower East Side of near, near Suffolk Street. Uh, Meyer London sat in on a lot of these meetings. He, he knew uh, as a young man, uh, and he, he rejected much to his father's disappointment, uh, anarchism, and went off in the direction of, of uh, social. Matter of fact, he, he probably heard Jonathan Most, who was a, uh, who was a, uh, a leading German uh, anarchist at that, at, that particular, at that particular time. So given the complexion, let me put it this way, given the complexion of the socialist uh, uh, party, I can readily say that uh, uh, so the socialist party was not a monolithic uh, organization. You have right, left, center. Uh, I was just gonna say Bill Haywood uh, preached violence. Uh, it was, founder of the IWW, uh, but I don't think we would necessarily characterize him as an anarchist. I, I hope that's helped. Some okay. people do, yeah. The thing is that Meyer London also backed the part of the labor movement that was not anarchist. He backed the AFL-CIO rather than the IWW, the International Workers of the World, and many of the anarchists did become communists, and Meyer London was a sort of center socialist. He wasn't part of the right at all. The right was for World War I, and he wasn't a left, anarch a left socialist who mainly left the Socialist Party and became communist. He was a center socialist. But I think Daniel, you have Daniel to, I think to. you really have to, differ just one final word, you really have to differentiate uh, uh, among the socialists, not necessarily based on, on the war experience itself. Uh, I, would, I would have London as a, I would have London on the right of the party with, with Berger for the, for the most part. Uh, although they split, they split, yeah, there, are, there are issues where there are differences, absolutely. Absolutely, there are differences, there are differences, yes. Okay, um, so I would say that, uh, well, in the very early period in the 1880s, um, socialism and anarchism uh, were not as clearly differentiated among many of the activists and there were organizations in which you found uh, both sorts of radicals and they you know, were kind of debating things. This started to separate out by the 1890s. Uh, but the, uh, the socialists and the anarchists did cooperate, for example, in the labor movement. Uh, they did cooperate within the workman's circle. and. After the, uh, after the communist split, increasingly in the 1920s and 30s, the anarchists and the socialists found themselves on the same side uh, within the labor movement against the communists. So within the ILGWU, within the workman's circle, although these were dominated by uh, kind of uh, right-wing social democrats, uh, they were happy to have anarchists as allies and as kind of junior partners. And that was true, by the way, also of the cooperative housing movement um, uh, led by Alfred Kazin, who was a philosophical anarchist. Wow, look at all these questions. Go ahead, go for it. You choose. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get in trouble. 
I'll, I'll make it quick, I promise. Thank you so much. It's such a uh, wonderful evening. Um, several of you mentioned uh, London's career as a lawyer. I know that he got his start in the office of Isaac Horwich. Um, there's a very funny uh, contract between the two of them. Um, both of them, as pioneers of labor law, had a very hierarchical and very serious fee splitting agreement uh, in which London definitely made the how Warwick made the lion's share and London was told what to do. So I, my question is uh, if any of you could speak to uh, the details of his legal work and what he did as a lawyer. Thank you. He uh, generally uh, handled uh, cases involving uh, what it was uh, in so far as tenant dispossession evictions. Uh, he might also have dealt with uh, injunctions against uh, uh, labor labor unions, uh, cases of that particular of, of that particular sort primarily, uh, the kind of cases that were not calculated to uh, bring him uh, a monetary award. Let's put it, put it rewards. Let's put it that way. And the settlements of strikes, and it, he did a lot of settlements. He was really unbelievable at compromising. And he, he could compromise in these strikes and he negotiated them. And some people were very disappointed with him. I mean, I first was introduced to Maya London by women trade unionists and they hated these compromises that he made. <laughs> Wait, when you were uh, first introduced to him, you didn't yeah. know you were related to him? Oh, I did know I was related to him, but I didn't know a lot about him. Got it, I okay. Got Uh -huh. He, I don't know if we touched on it, he acted as the sure. attorney for the ILGWU during its formative years, particularly the strike in 1910. He uh, represented the International Fur Workers Union uh, in its uh, organ uh, formative years as, and the strike in 1912. Uh, he was, uh, he uh, served as consul to the Arbiter's Ring uh, from almost his inception to his death in 19, uh, 1925. Uh, so he was uh, 26. Uh, he uh, was very instrumental in, in those kinds of uh, matters. Good. Let's do another And like question. compromising, he had to compromise and he couldn't put in that there should be rules that guaranteed the workers healthy environments. Great. So that was something he had to compromise on. Mm -hmm. and the workers yes. in the shops didn't like that. The gentleman in the blue sweater. Professor Goldberg, in your book, you have this very interesting uh, section about when London made it to Congress and his uh, reception from the sort of established political parties and politicians in Washington, especially Martin Dye Sr., uh, whose son Martin Dye Jr. eventually created HUAC. Um, and I thought that was very interesting. And I think it's um, very interesting to think about how Russian Jews, Russian socialist Jews at this uh, period in history were uh, interpreted by the American populace uh, in general. So maybe you can speak to that. How were Jews in the Lower East Side in New York, Russian Jews, uh, Yiddish-speaking Jews, um, and other immigrant groups who had these radical traditions and, uh, and voted on them in America, how were they viewed and interpreted in American society more generally? Are you talking about in the Congress or just? In Congress and maybe uh, as uh, the, the congressmen representing their constituencies, how were they uh, viewed in uh, places that had recently voted populous? Um, in one particular, let me just give you one particular case that comes to mind in the, in the, in the, in the House. On one particular instance, after a debate, London was approached by a fellow House member who came up to him and literally got in his face and just looked at him. And London came away with, with the feeling that, well, he had never seen somebody like me before, and he was trying to size me up and to see how I, see how I would, would react. Uh, he, uh, was there, if you're getting at, was there any indications of anti-Semitism in the, in the house, for example? Uh, there were, 
Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, it was more rhetorical in, in, in nature. Uh, London, on occasions, had some caustic, uh, uh, you know, interchanges uh, in, in, in this exchanges in this particular regard. Uh, but uh, it wasn't. Uh, he got along very, very well with his colleagues. Uh, he um, was supported by Republicans and Democrats alike. Uh, there was one particular instance when when one member of the Congress wanted to censor him for some comments that London made. And two of his close associates, uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Edward Keating of Colorado, uh, a Democrat, came to his defense. And the other one, interestingly enough, again, was Meadow McCormick, the owner and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, which many of you know is a, uh, became a very conservative uh, uh, newspaper. And I couldn't get over reading the congressional record that he's constantly, like, given 45 minutes more. He was really a teacher. I mean, he knew more American history than any of them, and he'd explain the history. And constantly he was given, I mean, 45 minutes is a long time, and he made these long, long, eloquent speeches and was pretty respected. He was the chess champion of the Congress. <laughs> he was definitely more learned than most of them. Let me, let me just say in, in this particular regard, he was recognized, which is very unique, I, and you compare it to what is going on in the Congress today, he was treated really for the most part with a great deal of civility. Uh, and he was recognized as uh, the Socialist Party, as he represented the Socialist Party, and he had the same uh, rights on the floor as did others. And on one occasion, uh, he, I remember, he was invited to preside over the House, much to the chagrin of some of his uh, conservative critics. On, an, uh, on a, several other occasions, he was invited to close debates on key pieces of, of, of legislation. Uh, how Russian Jews were regarded uh, outside of the country? Well, let's, let's just go to New York City. How were Russian Jews uh, regarded by uptown Jews, the German Jewish community. Uh, they, they, uh, you know, they, they were very much concerned about them. I think the difference was, though, that the up, so-called uptown community, the, the so-called German Jews, not all of them were really German, but they were from Prussian-controlled uh, Polish provinces and Hungarian provinces and so on. Um, for the most part, uh, always defended open immigration, always defended uh, um, Im the Jewish immigrant communities against attacks from the outside. Uh, of course, London was in Congress in 1921 when the uh, first of two restrictive immigration laws were passed in the 1920s, 1921 and 1924, uh, and he voted against it. Um, and not the only argument for those laws, but one strand of the argument that went into passing these laws to keep certain kinds of immigrants out uh, was uh, there was a strand of anti-Semitism, and it was often tied to the sense that these Eastern European Jews were uh, radicals, were communists or socialists or anarchists. So uh, th this uh, kind of peaked in the 1920s, and uh, London fought against it, but uh, not successfully. He, he was the principal spokesman in the Congress for the uh, urban industrial worker. And even before the National Origins Acts of the, of the 20s, London spoke against the Burnett uh, Literacy Bill, in 19, uh, which was passed uh, uh, in 1916 and 1917, which was vetoed on both occasions by, by Woodrow Wilson, and, but the veto was over, eventually overridden. All right. So just uh, you know, to bring back up Annie Polland, who is a co-author with Daniel Sawyer and who's really curated this wonderful talk tonight, I just want to introduce her with someone who is decidedly not a zero without a circumference. I just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just want to stress that Annie introduced me as I said I was the author of uh, The Emerging Metropolis, New York Jews in the Age of Immigration. <laughs> And I was the co-author with Dr. Annie Polland. <laughs> uh, she didn't mention that. So she's a winner of the National Book Award. Uh, and she's also uh, from Milwaukee, right? So they're Lancelite, and that's the uh, connection there. This is really about me tonight. I hope you have comfortable. The next hour is really about me. Um, 
41. Um, I have a really wonderful daughter. She's 10. I'm just joking. I want to, though, thank from the bottom of my heart um, those the, Andy Bachman, who did a wonderful job moderating, um, Rosalind Baxendahl, who is a historian and also, as you picked up, the, the grand niece or the great niece. I can't quite figure out what the right terminology is, but their grand, her grand. She's great and grand. <laughs> um, Gordon Goldberg and um, Daniel Sawyer, co-author of that wonderful book. Um, these books are available for sale tonight. Um, the, the Meyer London's book, um, I mean, Gordon Goldberg's book on Meyer London. Um, and if you buy them tonight, you get a 15% off discount special for the evening. And, um, and they, they will be signed, yes. <laughs> and I also encourage you to become members of the Tenement Museum if you haven't. And that membership helps support not only free programs like this, but almost every day we have free programs for um, people who are learning English, ESL students or ELL students who come on tours of the Tenement. And that way, I think we really connect um, past to present as well. So please, again, take, um, take our flyers that tell about our free programs. Be please become a member. Thank you, Con Edison. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Daniel, for doing such a just a marvelous job tonight. And thank you, Jeffrey Marsh. Yay. Yay. <laughs> thank you very much.